The way the government, the media and the Labour Party are talking about the Ukraine-Russia situation is not just wrong, it's actually dangerous. Firstly, Russia is awful. Don't get me wrong, I am no fan of Russia. Russia is an awful authoritarian state with no respect for human rights and Putin is a power-hungry dictator and we should be worried about what he plans to do next. Yep, that is all true. But Putin has legitimate reasons to be worried too. It is not a one-sided issue. Ukraine is talking about applying to join NATO, so quick history lesson. NATO was set up at the end of World War II to stop Soviet expansion and since then the Soviet Union has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and doesn't exist anymore and NATO has grown and grown and grown. In 1990 when East and West Germany unified, West Germany didn't want to have to leave NATO so it was agreed that no NATO troops or nuclear weapons would be positioned in the eastern part of the country. So at that point evidently we all understood that Russia might feel kind of threatened by NATO getting closer to its borders. And in 1991, NATO expressly agreed not to expand into Eastern Europe. Since then, Hungary, Czechia, Poland, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovenia, Slovakia, Romania, Croatia, Albania, Montenegro and North Macedonia have joined. All expanding NATO to the east and closer and closer to Russia. NATO claims to be a peaceful organisation, but illegally attacked Yugoslavia, invaded Afghanistan and seriously overstepped agreed measures in Libya. Also, and this really gets me, in 2014 NATO members collectively agreed to spend a minimum of 2% of their GDP on defence. So we're a peace club, but all members must spend 2% of all their money on military stuff. I mean, that's 2% of my money and yours. That's a huge amount of money. It forces NATO members to increase military budgets, often buying weapons from, you guessed it, us and the US. Is this peace? Is this how we achieve peace? Oh, and at the moment, guess what NATO is doing? They're moving four B-52 Stratofortress aircraft from the US to Fairford RAF base in Gloucester. These are bomber craft which have nuclear capability and they're now within range of Moscow and St. Petersburg. So remind me who is escalating things here. Yes, Putin is. Putin is a terrible person who is moving tanks about and trying to scare people, but so are we, massively. And Russia has another point too. In 2015, Ukraine agreed to allow the Donbass region of Ukraine, where a majority of people are native Russian speakers, to be autonomous and have their own government, and they haven't done it. Now, Russia hasn't stuck to their side of that agreement either, but unsurprisingly, a lot of people in the Donbass region who consider themselves Russian are pretty annoyed with Ukraine. It's a two-sided diplomatic issue. It's not a question of just Putin is bad and us and Ukraine are all good. It's complicated. But the media isn't giving that picture at all. Secondly, the UK government isn't doing all the other stuff that it could be doing to stop Russia since Boris took over. The Conservative Party has accepted over £2 million in donations from Russian oligarchs. The UK is such a welcoming place for Putin's mates to launder their dodgy money that it's known as the London Laundromat and London Grad. Mostly this is down to the issue of golden visas or as they're officially called investor visas. They basically say that if you invest £2 million in the UK you can have a visa. Between 2008 and 2015, over three billion pounds came into the country this way. And the bank said that this tier one investor status meant that they didn't have to do any other checks on where the money was coming from and whether it was legitimate. Only 3% of that money was subjected to due diligence checks. 97% came in just unchecked. And it's not like the UK necessarily benefited in some cases, people deliberately borrowed money from Russian banks and then invested in Russian companies in the, UK, in the UK, creating a circular path for money and getting their free visa on the way. Well, after the Salisbury murders business, the Tories said that they would launch a review of the visas that had been issued, but they still haven't published the results of that review. We are part of the Russian setup. How can we be fighting it and funding it? Since 2010, we've sold £56 million of military equipment to Russia and £38 million of military equipment to Ukraine. How can we be on both sides? If we want to stop war, we need to take all of the peaceful steps that we can to cut off supplies of arms and money to the situation. 
and then engage in real diplomacy, acknowledging Russian concerns and varied viewpoints from within the Ukraine and actually acting like grown-ups. Which brings me to point three. What we're doing instead of that. We're talking about a Russian invasion like it's definitely going to happen. In fact, it was supposed to happen according to some mysterious British intelligence, and don't even get me started on British intelligence weapons of mass destruction 45 minutes away, and the fact that the whole Bond franchise is a pile of sexist, xenophobic rubbish. It was supposed to happen on Wednesday, which is presumably why Prince Andrew decided to pay off Virginia Giffrey that day, thinking that he'd be on page eight of the papers right behind all the pictures of Russian tanks rolling across the borders, but it didn't happen. And Ukrainian President Zelensky says he hasn't even seen this intelligence, and he also said the biggest enemy is panic, and asked international leaders to stop talking up war. One thing I keep hearing is Putin's a bully. If we let him dictate that Ukraine can't join NATO, then whatever he wants next, he'll be able to tell us what to do. But Putin probably feels the same way about every single time NATO has expanded and all the rest. Maybe he feels like if he doesn't put his foot down at some point, the whole damn world will be in NATO and they'll rename it the Putin can fuck off club. The reality is that we can talk to him about this point and reach an agreement and then still disagree with him the next time he wants something. Otherwise we're saying, don't bother talking to us, we aren't going to listen to your concerns. The only way to get what you want is a war and that is stupid and childish and ridiculous and dangerous. So if Ukraine, the place at risk of invasion, doesn't want all this escalatory talk about war, who does? I mean, unless unrest in the region could stop the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia to Germany becoming operational and thus increase the value of US shale gas exports. I mean, it's not like any previous wars have been monstrous shams about democracy and human rights and fairness that ultimately were about protecting oil and gas producers. You really would have thought we'd have wised up to this by now. Can I, can I shout wake up sheeple yet? But finally, and this really is the big point here, even if you don't agree with everything that I've said or you're not sure about it or you suspect that I'm some crazy left-wing conspiracy theorist who's trying to build a big gay feminist rainbow utopia where it's all free love and no borders and I am I 100% am but however much you question my sources or whatever we can agree on this war is a big deal a war in Ukraine would kill thousands and thousands of people at absolute minimum possibly into millions if it spilled back into Russia and other places. And if it went nuclear, then that's the end of the world as we all know it. But at bare minimum, that's a whole generation of those in the Donbass region. That's 44 million people, equivalent to two thirds of the UK population, who would lose their homes, their livelihoods, their education, their safety. They'd lose family members and loved ones. The impact mentally and financially would last a lifetime and beyond. Poland and Romania are already talking about how they would cope with hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees arriving. Liz Truss is already saying they wouldn't be welcome in the UK. War is huge, millions of lives devastated, the impact on ordinary people lasting for generations. And let's not forget the impact on those in the military on all sides, the PTSD, the injuries, the lives lost, the hearts broken. Is all of that worth it in order to show Putin that we're tough? Couldn't we just send him some pictures of us horse riding with our shirts off? Couldn't we be tough, first of all, by cracking down on money laundering? Couldn't we be tough around a negotiating table? Or better still, couldn't we lead by example and instead of being tough, be reasonable? Acknowledge concerns, listen to all sides, engage in real diplomacy, starting by not spreading inflammatory one-sided nonsense in the press. I'll see you next week.